Before we begin, I'd just like to mention that while I will try to cover most of the important rules of the game, this will not be a fully comprehensive tutorial, but is rather meant to introduce the most important aspects for you to be able to start a game as soon as possible. The following tutorial only includes the base game of Endless Space 2. Endless Space 2 is a 4x turn-based grand strategy game set in a science fiction universe. It was developed by Amplitude Studios and published by Sega. The goal in Endless Space 2 is to be the first faction to achieve one of six victory conditions. When in game, you can click on this icon on the upper left side of the screen and then the victory tab. Here, you'll find the victory conditions and your current standing for those conditions. Supremacy victory requires you to take control of all of your opponent's homeworlds or colony bases. Conquest victory is achieved by controlling the majority of star systems in the galaxy. Science victory is achieved when a faction has been able to research the most expensive technologies from the technology screen. Economy victory is achieved when a faction or alliance produces a certain amount of dust, which is the game's currency. Wonder victory is achieved when a set number of the obelisks of all space-time system improvement has been built by your faction or alliance. Score victory is given to the faction with the most points after a set number of turns if no other victory conditions were achieved within the set time limit. Your score is determined by different aspects of the game. Some of these victory conditions will be explained in depth later in the video, but you can hover over each one to see a more detailed explanation. In this screen, you'll also find your current standing for each victory condition here, compared to your opponents. There can also be multiple winners as alliances can be made with other empires. If you are part of an alliance with another empire, these victory conditions will change to adapt to the alliance scale. As an example, here, you'll see that the science victory currently requires four of the technologies of the Endless to accomplish. But fast forwarding to having an alliance with another empire, it has now changed to six. And the more members you have in an alliance, the higher the number and the other victory condition requirements go. Before we get into the actions you can do, first we'll need to explain an important aspect of the game. Clicking on a star system you control will zoom in on the system, and I'd like to turn your attention to these icons on the left panel. This is the FIDC. FIDC stands for food, which is used to grow and sustain a system's population, industry, which is used to construct improvements in systems and to build ships, dust, which is the currency of the game and is used when buying, selling, or trading a variety of things, science, which is used to research technologies that will unlock various functions for your empire, and influence, which is used when interacting with other empires like for negotiations. These are your basic resources and what your empire will use and spend to be able to perform the different actions in the game. The numbers beside the icons represent the amount you produce per turn for each resource. You can hover the cursor over each resource type to view where the production is coming from. For example, we can see that we are currently producing a total of 29 food per turn in this system. 35 food is being produced here since this is our colony base. 18 food comes from Hakim, which is the only planet colonized in the system. 5.3 food is being consumed for the production of manpower and 18.3 food is being consumed to sustain the system's population. Take note that food and industry can only be utilized by the system that produced it, while dust, science, and influence are pulled together for empire-wide uses. Aside from the basic resources, there are also strategic and luxury resources. The strategic resources available to your empire you'll find here in the upper left-hand panel. They need a certain technology to be harvested and can only be harvested from colonized planets that produced them. In our current example, we can see that Bellatrix 2 produces 3 Titanium and 3 Hyperium once we are able to colonize that planet and research the required technologies for each. The luxury resources we'll get to at a later chapter. Strategic and luxury resources are mostly used or required for more advanced actions and functions, such as bigger ships, better ship parts, better system improvements, and so on. However, they aren't as easy to gain or produce like basic resources. While I won't be explaining everything that will make use of these resources, we should be able to tackle a few of them as we go further. Another resource you'll be utilizing throughout the game is manpower. You can find your current manpower here and its production as well. Manpower is mostly used for combat, but it has other uses too, and we'll explain them when they become relevant later on. A game of Endless Space 2 is divided into turns. 
Each turn, you're able to do several actions, the amount of which are dependent on some factors. At the start of your turn, you'll always receive notifications on the lower right side of your screen that will inform you of events in your empire that might need tending to. This is very useful so you won't miss out on available actions. In this example, our notifications are telling us that we have discovered two new luxury resources that should be helpful when harvested, and that we have a new hero that can be assigned a job for additional bonuses. I want to note that you don't have to worry about missing out on these notifications. If you do, the game will give you a reminder of things you might have missed, if any, once you end the turn. In the same example, after clicking on End Turn, the game doesn't do so, and instead reminds us that Bellatrix system isn't currently constructing anything, our research queue is empty, and that our new hero is still unassigned. By clicking on these notifications, you'll be provided the relevant information relating to the available action. And there will be a button as well that should send you to the relevant screen for you to be able to do those actions. Before we move on, I'd like to briefly explain one of the notifications you might receive during the game called Quests. There are several types of quests that you can receive, but basically, these are events that you can choose to do or participate in to receive different kinds of rewards and sometimes penalties. Most of them are timed, meaning you'll have to accomplish them within a set number of turns. Some of these quests are exclusive to you, but some are competitive or semi-cooperative with the other empires where it becomes a race to accomplish a task, with better rewards given to those who contributed more to the quest. To give an example, here's the first quest we received in our current game. As you can see, we're given three options to choose from, each of them requiring different things to do and providing different rewards as well. One of the things you can do during a turn is to research a technology. You can open the technology screen by clicking on this icon on the main panel. Technologies provide new and better tools for a variety of functions when researched. When shopping for potential technologies, you can always refer to the icons around them for information. The small circles will tell us what will be unlocked when that technology is researched, and the color of the circle will tell us in what aspect the unlocks will be useful. For example, Plasma Metallurgy has two orange icons, which means both of them will provide industry-related abilities. If we are able to research Plasma Metallurgy, our empire will gain a new system improvement for producing more industry, and it will give our empire the ability to harvest Hyperium one of the strategic resources in the game. I won't go over all the icons as there's quite a lot, but you can always hover your cursor over to read what they offer. However, I will go over some of them if they become relevant to the tutorial. Science is the resource used when researching a technology, with the production amount determining how long a research will take. In the same example, plasma metallurgy costs 66 science to research. We can see on the left-hand panel that we currently produce 35 science per turn. This means that it will take us two turns to research this technology. I'd also like to point out that researching a technology will increase the science cost for all other technologies, therefore possibly increasing the turns it will take to research succeeding technologies, encouraging you to be more efficient in choosing what to research in future turns. Clicking on a technology puts it in your research queue, and while we are able to queue multiple items, take note that only one item can be researched at a time. This means that only the first technology in line will progress even if you have multiple technologies lined up. You'll be able to see how many turns it will take to research a technology using the numbers below each of them on the queue. You can cancel the researching of a technology by clicking on it, and you can also move them around by dragging a queued technology if you change your mind on which one you want researched first. I'd like to point out that any science spent in the research of a technology gets saved permanently even if you move down or cancel unfinished research so none of the resource spent will ever go to waste. There are four branches of technologies with each branch specializing on an aspect of your empire. Military technologies help with combat and planet defense. Economy and trade improves industry and thus functions and production. Science and exploration improves science production and exploration efficiency. Empire development improves food and influence production, unlocks and upgrades ship types, and provides new ways for, of interacting with other empires. While that's just a general overview for the quadrants of the technology wheel, each quadrant may also have unique technologies in them, usually different for each faction. You find these by looking for your faction icon on the technology wheel. For example, here you'll see that Sino Linguistics has the faction icon for the Sophons, which means either this technology is unique for the current faction we're using, 
or it provides different bonuses compared to what will be available here instead for other factions. The technology wheel is divided into levels with higher levels providing better functions and abilities to your empire. However, to be able to research higher level technologies, you'll need to unlock the level for the technology by researching lower ones first, and you'll need to follow the connecting lines as well if there are any. I'd like to point out as well that when unlocking higher levels, aside from other technologies becoming available, unlocking a new level itself will provide additional benefits as well represented by the circles here. Let's give an example. Let's say I wanted to research maximized exploitation, which is a level 3 technology. In our current state, I'm not able to do so, as you can tell with the technology still being grayed out. First, I'll need to unlock the level 3 technologies, and to do so, I need to research two technologies from level 2 as pointed out by the two circles here. Aside from that, we can see that maximized exploitation has a line connecting it to a level 2 technology. This means that we need to have atmospheric filtration researched first as well in order to have access to maximized exploitation. Fast forwarding several turns, after two level 2 technologies have been researched, including atmospheric filtration, we are now able to research maximize exploitation. Take note that some parts of the technology wheel will give you an option between two similar technologies, that when one is chosen, the other will become unavailable to you for the rest of the game. As an example, here, we can see that there is a line between advanced fusion power and Hyperion magnetics. Fast forwarding to the research completion of one of them, we can now see that we are no longer able to click on the other one. A very helpful function in the technology screen that I'd like to point out is the search bar. Here, you can simply search for keywords to help you find the technologies that are best suited for your intentions. For example, if I were looking for technologies that would help with science production, I can simply type in science, and all related technologies will be highlighted. Another thing you'll find in the technology screen are deeds. These are tasks that you and other empires will raise to finish for certain bonuses, which means each deed can only be accomplished by one empire in a game. These can be accessed by unlocking the levels the deeds belong to. Continuing with the example earlier, we were able to unlock the third level of the economy and trade quadrant with what we researched. As we can see, the consolidator of systems deed is now available to us. It can be accomplished by being the first empire to control four star systems in the same constellation. And if completed, it will provide us a unique improvement that will only be available to our empire. Before moving on, I'd like to give a reminder that science victory is one of the ways to win the game, which can be accomplished from this screen. On the outer part of the circle, you'll find the four final technologies. When all have been researched before any other victory is met by any empire, you'll win the game. But remember that the number of these that need to be researched will increase if in an alliance with another empire. At the start of the game, you'll find yourself with at least one star system that has already been colonized by your faction. This is your faction's home system or colony base. A faction's home system is marked with a crown symbol of their faction color. Aside from the home system, you'll also start the game with some ships, but we'll get to explaining those a bit later. A star system has several functions that you'll manage throughout the game. As the game progresses, you'll be controlling more and more systems, each of which you'll have to manage individually. When you click on a star system, you'll be greeted by several important information. The planets in the system, the stats of this particular system, the improvements available for construction, the construction queue, and the ships that are currently docked in this system, if any. There are several actions we can perform for each star system. The basic ones are colonizing a new planet in the system, building system improvements, studying curiosities, if there are any, and building ships. Most of these actions will be listed in the construction queue and will be accomplished in order just like technologies. And like researching technologies, you can cancel and change the order of the queue if you happen to change your mind on certain actions. As mentioned earlier, each system has to be managed individually, so in future turns where your empire has colonized more star systems, each of them will have their own construction queue where tasks for that particular system go when initiated. Aside from building ships, most of the actions that will be available for each star systems, like the ones I mentioned earlier, are basically just a means to produce more resources for your empire. As the game progresses and technologies are researched, more and more different tasks for your systems will become available. But for now, we'll only explain the ones available to us at the start of the game. 
We usually start the game with one planet colonized in our home system. You'll find the current status of planets here when looking at the overview of the system and at the bottom of each planet when zoomed in. As we can see in our example, we only have one colonizable planet at the moment. Inhospitable planets will require a technology to be researched before they can be colonized. For instance, Bellatrix 1 requires the Hyperpax technology. Like most actions, colonization of available planets has a cost. By hovering over the colonization action, we can see that this action will cost a total of 80 industry that will take 3 turns to produce with our current industry production. Colonizing a planet will provide more resources production for both the star system and your empire. You can find the summary of the benefits above each planet, and you can hover your cursor over the planet to see a more detailed description. For example, Bellatrix 2 provides some food, industry, dust, and science production, but no influence. In addition, it will also provide us Titanium and Hyperium, two strategic resources once the required technologies to harvest them have been researched. Take note that a planet's production will be affected by the number and type of population that you assign as inhabitants. And another thing to factor in are the traits of the planet as they might provide positive or negative buffs depending on the population as well. We will get into more detail about this in the next chapter. Before we continue with the other star system actions, I'd like to explain population. In the star system management screen, another thing you'll find are the population occupying your planets which is represented by the dotted lines above each planet. The number of lines represent the maximum number of population that each planet can hold. By hovering your cursor over a planet, you'll see what population types are currently occupying them, if any. In this case, our starting planet has three populations, two Sophons and one Pilgrims. By hovering our cursor over them, a panel will appear that will explain what bonuses they provide to our empire. In the same example, each Sophon's population provides an additional 1 science production and 3 additional science production if they are currently occupying a planet with a cold trait. In this pop-up, we'll also find other information associated with the population type, such as its political opinion and preferred luxury item, but we'll explain these later. Another important panel in the star system management screen that relates to population is this one, that refers to population growth. Remember that food is the resource that helps with population growth. The higher the food production, the faster population will be produced. Here, we can see how many turns it will take for our population to grow and what population type will be produced. Population type is randomized between the currently available types in the system. However, by opening the population overview by clicking on a population type on the left panel, you can spend each of the population's preferred luxury resource to increase the chances of producing the associated population type. For example, if we wanted more sophons in our empire, we can spend two deciduous trees once we are able to get some. This is one of the uses of luxury resources. Another important aspect that you can find in the population panel is the system approval. This represents your population's overall happiness in the system. As you can probably guess, a high system approval will result in positive buffs, while a low system approval can result in negative ones. As always, you can hover the cursor to see a detailed explanation as to how the resulting percentage is computed and the accompanying positive or negative effects of the current status. To help manage your populations once you have multiple planets in a star system, you can freely move them between planets by dragging them from one planet to another to better utilize them by matching them with their preferred planet traits. However, take note of the red line. If a planet's population reaches this, it will be considered overpopulated and the system's approval will receive a penalty. And once the required technology is researched, you'll also be able to move populations from one system to another. System improvements are upgrades you can build in a star system. They provide different benefits such as better resource production, better defenses, and so on. Like everything else, they have a cost to build and usually an upkeep cost as well. As an example, let's take a look at drone networks. As we can see, it has a cost of 80 industry. Our system currently produces 34 industry per turn which means it will take 3 turns to complete this improvement. This is signified by this symbol beside the cost, so we don't need to make the computations ourselves. The drone network's improvement has an upkeep cost of 2 dust per turn as well. This means that every turn, our empire dust will decrease by 2 for each of this particular improvement that has been built throughout our empire. Once the construction of this improvement is complete, the system will gain an additional 10 production of both food and industry. And again, these computations will be automatically done for us. Fast forwarding to when the improvement is complete, 
By hovering on our system's FIDC, we can see that we have a current food production of 38 due to several factors including the newly built drone network's improvement. Some improvements have requirements for their benefits to take effect even after they have been constructed. For instance, let's take a look at public-private partnerships. One of the benefits of this improvement is it gives plus 10 science for fertile. This means that you'll get the additional 10 science production for each planet with a fertile trait in this system that has already been colonized. At this point, I'd like to mention that some technologies will allow you to terraform colonized planets to change their traits to make them even more compatible to your improvements and overall strategy. We will explain this further in a later chapter. As the game progresses and more technologies have been researched, more and better system improvements will be available for construction. Take note that some improvements can only be constructed by your empire once, and some can only be constructed by a single empire. As an example, in our current game, we have the Endless Research Park and Endless World improvement available to us. When hovering over the improvement, we can see that it mentions that this improvement can only be built once per galaxy. This means that once this improvement has been built by an empire, it will become unavailable to all other empires. Ships, like system improvements, also have an industry cost and an upkeep cost. The difference is that ships will appear in the hangar once completed. You'll need to create a fleet of ships on your hangar before they can be deployed to move around the galaxy. You can do so by clicking this button here once the ships you want to combine as a fleet are already in the system's hangar, and you'll find the fleet ready to be moved once you zoom out. I want to mention that you can create a fleet even with just a single ship if you want one to move around on its own. Most factions will start the game with two constructible ships, with more becoming available once specific technologies have been researched. Ships in this game are customizable, but we'll get to that in a later chapter. Curiosities are random things that can be found on planets but need to be studied to gain access to. They can be additional planet traits or additional resources. If a curiosity is within a system where you have a colonized planet, the curiosities can be placed in the construction queue to be studied for a cost. They can also be studied using ships if you don't have a colonized planet in the system, but we will explain that further in the next chapter. Another major part of the game is exploring the vast galaxy. In earlier turns, this is mainly done through the movement of ships through star lanes, with more traveling options, such as warp and wormhole travel, becoming available through technologies. Star lanes are represented by lines connecting star systems to form a constellation, with the galaxy comprising of several constellations. You start the game with a number of ships depending on your faction and a single visible star system. Another way of exploring the galaxy in the earlier parts of the game is by launching drones. You can do this by selecting a ship with a drone, in our current case the detector, and choosing the direction we'd like the drones to explore. The drones will travel in that direction for several turns, revealing everything it passes through. While drones in ships are unlimited, they still take several turns to replenish before more can be used. You can increase the number of drones a ship can carry by customizing them, but we'll have to explain that a bit later. There are different types of ships, and again, sometimes they differ depending on your faction. In our example, the Sophons start with a detector and an incubator. The detector has probes used to scout unexplored areas and to study curiosities, as mentioned earlier and the incubator is used to colonize planets in unoccupied star systems to expand your empire and galaxy control. Each ship has a number of movement points that dictate how much it can move per turn. Ships can also be merged together to form a fleet that can move together, but the fleet's movement will always follow the ship within the fleet with the lowest movement points. Here, we can see that the detector's movement speed is 9, and the incubator's is 8. After merging the two to create a fleet, we can see that the fleet takes the incubator's movement speed as it is slower. The satellite icon represents your current maximum command points. This number dictates how many ships can be merged together to form a fleet. Take note that not all ships are worth one command point as bigger and more powerful ships may cost more. Like everything else in the game, you can increase your command point limit through technologies. In our current scenario, we have two ships, each of them costing one command point. We currently have a maximum of 5 which means we should be able to combine them together no problem with room for more. Fleets can be disbanded in a star system you control if you want the ships to separate. This will park them in the star system's hangar which means you'll need to create a fleet with each of them individually to be able to deploy them again. One of the things you should be on the lookout for when exploring the galaxy are star systems with useful planets. 
These can be planets that provide strategic and luxury resources you don't have access to yet, planets with traits that complement your population types, or planets that produce a high amount of a basic resource that you know you'll need a lot of. Once you find a star system you like, you'll need to colonize it to reap its benefits. To colonize a vacant star system, you'll need to send a colonizer ship to the system. In our current scenario, we started with an incubator which is the Sophon's colonizer. Once the colonizer is on the system, simply choose which planet you'd like to occupy first and click on the flag icon. As mentioned earlier, some planets won't be colonizable at the start of the game and will require certain technologies to be colonized. Take note that there's a soft limit to the number of systems you can colonize. You can find the limit by clicking on this icon to open the Empire Summary screen and it will be located here on the lower left part of the left panel. Going over this limit will result in an Empire-wide system approval penalty. As usual, you can increase this limit by researching certain technologies. Colonization of vacant systems isn't instantaneous. It will first become an outpost where a certain number of food needs to be delivered to complete the process. The delivery of the food is automated via ships through star lanes and will come from your colonized star systems. This is another thing to consider when deciding what systems to colonize, as enemy empires and neutral factions can interrupt this process if they have ships occupying or wandering around the delivery routes. There are several ways to speed up the process of the colonization. In our current example, we can spend manpower, dust, or influence to do this. You can also stop the colonization process if you change your mind by clicking on this button here. Take note that a star system with your outpost isn't yours yet, so other empires can come in and start colonizing a different planet. In this case, it becomes a race as the first empire to complete the colonization process gets to keep the system, with the other opposing outposts getting destroyed. When in competition with another empire in colonizing a system, there are several ways to hinder the enemy's colonization process, one of which is guarding the system with a ship or fleet. Placing a ship in the system and pressing the guard button will stop enemy empires from delivering food to the outpost. Take note that the removal of the ship, whether by you or your enemies, will continue the colonization process. In this example, we can see that the enemy empire will successfully colonize the system in 9 turns. By clicking the guard button on our ship, we can see that this icon has appeared, telling us that this outpost is now dying due to lack of food delivery. Fast forwarding several turns, we can see that the outpost has now been starved and destroyed, leaving the system unoccupied once again. At this point, I'd like to remind that one of the victory conditions you can aim for is Conquest Victory, which will require you to colonize a certain amount of star systems in the galaxy. As explained earlier, curiosities can be studied if you have a colonized planet within the same star system. However, if this is not the case, ships with probes can be used to discover what they are instantaneously. And to reiterate, curiosities will usually either provide some kind of bonus like resources, or they can be an additional trait for the planet the curiosity belongs to. Some curiosities will appear with a locked symbol, meaning, as you can probably guess by now, require certain technologies for us to be able to study them. In this case, we need a technology that will raise our curiosity expedition power. Minor civilizations are population types with their own planets that are not yet associated with any empire. Once you discover a minor civilization, you'll be greeted by a screen like this, and you'll be presented with options on how you'd like to interact with them, some of which might not be available at the moment, needing certain technologies to be researched first or progressing your relationship with the minor civilization. This is one of the uses of influence one of the parts of Fidzi. Some interaction options, whether it's with a minor civilization or another empire, will require influence to be spent. In this panel, you can also see a bar which represents how much this particular population likes you. Advancing this will unlock other interaction options. Each option is also used to reach a certain goal, whether it's to integrate them to your empire or to annihilate them as they might not be as useful to you or might even provide some benefits for opposing empires. When deciding on what to do with a minor civilization, the best things to look at are the benefits they provide as a population. In our current example, this population we discovered have the traits Warmonger and Stalwart Stoics. By hovering over these, we'll be able to see the benefits they will provide if they are integrated to our empire. The second box on the other hand shows the benefits they will provide when placed in our planets. The third box provides information on the political outlook of this population. We'll explain this later when we get into the political elements of the game. The fourth box will show the benefits of having a friendly relationship with the minor civilization once a certain amount of progress in that aspect has been made.
Pirates are a factionless population that can be quite unpredictable in their nature. They randomly pop up all over the galaxy, colonize star systems, and have ships that constantly move around fighting and exploring. They can also grow as a population, so be careful not to leave them alone. They cannot be converted to your empire, and mostly just pose a threat to some plants to keep you on your toes. Neutral celestial bodies are uninhabitable parts of the galaxy that provide some bonuses to the star system that has it inside their influence ring. Your star system's influence is represented by a ring around them with the color of your faction. This ring increases as the influence production on a star system increases. Aside from neutral celestial bodies, the influence ring also has other uses, but we'll get to that in a later chapter. Another thing you'll encounter when exploring the galaxy are other empires. These are your opponents or possibly future allies. They are also racing to achieve one of the various victory conditions explained earlier. Like minor civilizations, a new screen with diplomacy and trading options will become accessible once you meet another empire. The screen can be accessed by clicking on the empire's icon on the map or through here, the diplomacy screen. Here, you'll see empires you've met and empires you haven't. In the negotiation screen, you'll also find the current diplomacy status you have with an empire and the influence pressure bar. This bar will dictate who has more power in the relationship, which can also dictate how good or bad an offer the empire will accept from you when negotiating. This can be increased through various actions such as getting their favor by helping them out or threatening them by invading or attacking them. As mentioned earlier, negotiation and trading will require a lot of influence. You can find your current influence here in this screen, and as usual, you can hover the cursor over some of the options to see a detailed description of their effects. I'd also like to note that you don't lose any influence if your offer was declined by other empires. Let's take a look at some examples of interactions we can have with other empires. In the diplomacy screen, we are presented with things we can trade with this empire. Since it's still pretty early in the game, there aren't a lot of options yet. Looking at the influence bar, we can see that they currently don't have a lot of leverage over us, so it's still a good time to make an offer as they would probably still be okay with deals that benefit us equally. Since we're not looking to fight anyone this early and are hoping to have a good relationship with our neighbor so we can trade with them later, we'll offer them a peace treaty which costs 157 influence. We currently have 200 influence, as we can see here, so we can easily afford this treaty. Before officially making the offer, we can check this bar down here to see how likely they are to accept or decline our current offer. It looks like they are pretty happy with this deal, and will most likely accept it. In cases where the empire you're dealing with isn't happy with your current offer, you can try to sweeten the deal by adding other things such as resources. But of course, this will cost more influence and it will be up to you to gauge if the deal is still worth it to you in those cases. Once we send the offer, we'll immediately find out their decision, which in this case, they gladly accept it. Another thing I'd like to mention is that you and other empires can colonize each other's star systems without going into battle. This is the other use for the influence ring explained earlier. Once another empire system is inside your influence ring and the relevant technology for this action has been researched, you can initiate a peaceful takeover of a system that will transfer the system's control to you once the process is complete. Remember that alliances can also be created where you and other empires will work together towards a victory condition. This can be done in the diplomacy screen as well once the required technology has been researched. But remember that alliances can be broken, so be careful how you treat other empires. At the start of the game, you will have one unassigned hero. Heroes are unique characters that can be assigned either to a fleet or a star system to provide certain effects. The longer a hero is assigned to a task, the more experience they gain which allows them to level up and allow you to assign them special skills for further effects. Each hero has their own ship, a somewhat unique skill tree, and several traits. These will provide you with information on how to best utilize your heroes. In our current example, our starting hero is a counselor, which means most of their skills will be excelling in resource production. Their starting skill is that they give plus 1 science production per population on planets, and plus 10% health for ships in their fleet. To further exemplify the use of heroes, since I'm not hoping to see any combat this early on the game, I'll be assigning this hero to my home system for the additional science production they provide. Heroes can be moved around through the hero management screen which can be accessed by clicking on this icon on the main panel. You can move heroes around as you need or see fit, but take note that they may take several turns to be reassigned as they would still have to travel to their new assignment like normal ships. 
Heroes in fleets can participate and contribute in combat as they have their own customizable ships. If they were ever defeated, heroes don't die and are merely considered injured, taking several turns to recover. Once they recover, they need to be reassigned to a fleet or a system again. More heroes can be acquired over time either by discovering the Academy, a planet that is randomly located somewhere in the galaxy, or by building the Academy Embassy, a system improvement that can be unlocked by a technology. By going to the hero management screen here, we'll see a progress bar that will indicate how long until we get another hero. The advancement of this bar and the type of hero we will acquire depends on the actions we perform during the game. You can hover over each hero type in this screen to see a more detailed description of each. As you probably noticed by now, another aspect of the game is politics. The main benefit of politics are the laws you'll be able to pass to gain even more bonuses. What laws will become available to you depends on the current political ideology of your empire. This is affected by pretty much everything, such as the population types in your systems, technologies you choose to research, improvements you choose to build, and so on. Political parties gain experience and provide related laws the longer they are kept as the leading political parties of your empire. Let's take a look at our current scenario to further explain politics. With our current government type, which is democracy, we are able to have three political parties represented, which means we should be able to pass laws from three political ideologies at the same time. As you can imagine, each government type has a different set of rules when it comes to passing laws. We currently have two available slots for laws, so let's take a look at our options. The current leading political parties in our empire are the scientists and the religious, which unlocks these two laws for us to use. Take note that laws have a normal cost and upkeep cost, both usually in influence. When your empire does not have enough influence to maintain laws, they automatically get abolished, available to be passed once you have enough influence again. You can also choose to voluntarily abolish laws if you want to decrease your influence spending or if you want to change the laws that are currently in effect. Other laws will come with other ideologies, and more laws can be unlocked through changes and advancement in an empire's political ideologies and leading political parties. They change through elections which occur once every several turns. In our current case, as we can see here, the next election will occur in 9 turns. As an example, fighting other factions a lot might increase your empire's leaning towards a military ideology. You can check your empire's political standing by asking for a survey here. Although surveys are also conducted automatically several turns before an election, which can help you gauge which ideologies are currently leading. This will give you a bit of time to alter your decisions if you prefer some ideologies to win over others. Take note that the political ideologies of your populations play a huge role in this aspect. By going to the Senate screen, clicking on the population details, we can see which political ideology each population are more inclined to support. Larger icons in the wheel indicate huge support for actions that lean towards that particular ideology. Medium-sized icons means normal support, and small icons indicate less. To give an example, let's take a look at the Sophons. This population will provide a huge boost in support when scientists-related actions are done. They are also special in that they will also add more support to scientists even when pacifist actions are done. Religious actions tend to get little support from them though. Aside from the bonuses you receive from populations when placed in specific planets, this is one aspect you need to consider when increasing your population and deciding which population to assimilate to your empire. As you can imagine, having populations with conflicting political ideologies can slow down the advancement of the political parties you prefer to improve. On the day of the elections, you can take certain actions to support your preferred party as well. Depending on the type of government you have, there are a number of actions that you can take that may require dust or influence, with more becoming available once the corresponding technologies have been researched. Let's take a look at an early example of an election. Here. I play the normal game with the Sophons doing actions that mostly lean towards scientists and industrialists, and election day has arrived. Having heroes assigned to systems will also help increase support for their preferred political party. I have one scientist hero assigned to my home system, which is why they appear here. In this screen, we'll also find the actions we can do to potentially influence the result of the election, but as we don't have any actions available to us at the moment, we'll move on to the next screen. Here. You'll find the breakdown of representatives in each of your systems. Representatives represent the support that each political party gained during the preceding turns. As I mentioned that most of the actions I took are mostly science and industry related, we can see that reflected here. 
This in turn results in the scientists and industrialists parties winning the election and unlocking this law for me to use. Before we explain how battles work, first we need to explain ships, ship blueprints, and ship parts. By clicking on the military screen, we'll find the ships that are currently available for construction for our empire. More ships can be unlocked through several means, the main one being through technology research. In the technology screen, you can find technologies with these ship symbols which unlocks new ship types and these symbols as well which upgrade current ship designs. Aside from acquiring other ship types, you can also customize the parts of your current ship designs. By clicking on a ship on the ship design panel and clicking on edit, you'll be able to change the parts of the ship. Take note that changing the designs of your current ships doesn't mean they will retroactively apply to ships already constructed. You'll still need to bring them to any star system you own for upgrading. Each ship has a number of slots for dedicated parts, and each module has costs and sometimes upkeep as well. In earlier parts of the game, you'll only have limited options for modules and slots. In our current example, we have an empty slot for a weapon module. By clicking on the weapon module tab, we can see the available options. You can hover the cursor over each module to see what they add to your ship. For weapon modules, you'll find its damage, damage type, and its range efficiency which we'll explain in a bit. As the game goes on, more and more modules can be unlocked either through exploration, events, or researching specific technologies. Going back to the technology screen, you'll find unlocks that pertain to certain types of ship modules such as weapons, shields, and support modules. I won't be going over every single one of them, but to give an example, Hyperion Magnetics will unlock two weapon modules. The color of the modules is important as it represents which type of strategic resource you will need in order to use the module. In this case, yellow being Hyperion. The significance of the different weapon and shield types is that some weapons are less effective towards ships with certain shield types. So it's important to have some knowledge of what modules compose a fleet before going into battle with them. You can do this by clicking on an enemy fleet that you may go into battle with which will give you the relevant information you need. For example, in our current scenario, we have an enemy fleet composed of one ship hovering over our side of the galaxy. I would like to get rid of this by either destroying it or scaring it away. By clicking this fleet and hovering the cursor over the ship, we can see that it has a shield value of 165 and its shield is strong against projectile weapons. We can also see that the fleet is equipped with projectile weapons. This means it will be beneficial for me to attack it with a ship or fleet that has energy weapons and projectile shields. Aside from weapons and shields, there are also different support modules that can be attached to ships that will provide different functions, such as additional movement, better drones, and so on, as combat isn't the only use for ships. There are a lot of these so I won't go over all of them, but you can always hover your cursor over each one to see what they contribute to your ship or fleet. I'd also like to remind that you can also customize your hero ships through the hero management screen. And unlike regular ships, hero ships automatically implement the changes you make to its design as long as they are in a system you own. Ship combat can be initiated when two or more fleets from different empires are present in a star system. Take note that when a ship battle is initiated, the fleets involved are not allowed to move or take action until the end of the battle. Once a ship battle is initiated, we'll be greeted by this screen. Here, we can see which ships are involved in the battle and the chances of winning for each side. Your chances of winning a ship battle depends on three major factors. The composition of your fleet, their positioning during the battle, and the tactic you choose for the battle. We already explained how to customize your ship, so let's move on to positioning and tactics cards. Once a battle is initiated, you can head over to the advanced screen to access these functions and create a better plan for the upcoming battle. Ship battles are presented in a grid with three rows. However, some rows can only be unlocked if the fleet in the battle has the right number of ships and command points. If available, we can change the starting position of our ships between these three rows. The importance of this coincides with the tactics cards you choose for the battle. Tactics cards represent your strategy for the battle which will include the movement of your ships during and an added bonus. These lines represent the movement your ships will execute during the battle depending on their starting position as the lines represent the three rows in the field of battle. The highlighted boxes represent the target positions of your ships, which can be in long range, medium range, or short range of the enemy. This is where the range of our weapons come in. By hovering over each ship, we'll be able to see in which range each ship is efficient at. And as you can imagine, 
placing each ship at their most efficient range is highly beneficial. Tactics cards also provide some kind of bonus to the fleet. In our current example, the tactics cards will either provide a bonus for energy weapons, a bonus to our energy shields, or bonus resources for destroyed opponent ships. While we currently only have three tactics cards to choose from in this battle, these cards can be changed beforehand. By going to the military screen represented by the ship icon in the upper left screen, and by clicking on this icon on the lower left panel, you'll find other tactics to choose from and more can be unlocked through various means such as researching technologies. You'll also see here that more slots can be unlocked through technologies as well, for you to be able to bring more cards and options during a battle. Choosing the starting positions, the movement, and the bonuses of your ships during battle is very important as it can make or break the fight. Take note that you'll also have the option to retreat if you're not interested in participating in a battle. In this case, your fleet will automatically move to a neighboring system only suffering a small damage as a penalty. After a battle, you'll be greeted with a battle result screen that will relay the victor, if any, and the surviving ships, if any. If both sides have remaining ships, another battle with the same fleets can be initiated again on the next turn. Ground combat is a means of invading planets that are already colonized by other empires. This is where manpower comes in, another type of resource. You can find your empire's current manpower and its production here, this number beside this icon. By hovering the cursor over it, we can see where the production comes from. Ships and systems can be occupied by a limited number of manpower which can be increased with system improvements, technologies, and ship modules. To initiate a ground combat as an attacker, you must have a fleet on a star system of another empire. Remember that your relationship status with empires may affect your ability to attack them or even your ability to enter their star systems. The invade action here in the lower left panel allows you to initiate the attack. But before clicking on it, if you hover over it, you'll be able to see the difference in manpower and ground troop types between your fleet and the system. This is one of the factors that will decide if a battle is winnable. As you can imagine, the more manpower a side has, the more chances they will win the battle. By going to the military screen, aside from ship designs, we'll also find the breakdown of manpower and ground troops. By clicking on Manage, we'll be able to access the ground troops and customize them a bit as well. There are three types of ground troops, infantry, armor, and air. Each type has its own individual stats and unique upgrades. Not all upgrades will be available immediately, and once available, will cost some resource to implement. The advantage of bringing different types of ground troops to a battle is that each type will be more effective against a specific type compared to others. Infantry can be more effective against air troops, armor against infantry, and air against armor. Another important thing we can do in this screen is to decide what percentage of our manpower will be allocated to certain types of ground troops during a battle. For instance, in our current example, I've set the percentage to 50% infantry and 50% armor. Last thing I want to emphasize about ground troops is that you can change the manpower allocation before the initiation of a ground battle and they will immediately apply. Once a ground battle has been initiated, you will be greeted by a screen that's a bit similar to the ship battle screen. Here, you'll find the same pie chart that will show which side has a larger chance of winning and, like in the ship battle screen, a few choices for possible tactics. Similar to the cards in ship battles, each card here will provide different bonuses. As you can imagine, some cards will be more effective than others depending on the type of units and the amount of manpower that you and your opponents have available. When defending instead of attacking, the screen will be quite similar. The planet's manpower will be divided according to the ratio you chose on the military screen and you'll get a choice of tactics as well. Just like ship battles, most ground battles cannot be won in a single turn. When attacking, after a turn of a ground battle, you can choose to continue attacking the next turn until one side has won or you can choose to retreat but take note that retreating will result in the loss of deployed manpower. Winning a ground battle when attacking will provide three options for what you'd like to do with the star system you just won. You can choose to either occupy, pillage, or raise the system. Occupying will result in gaining control of the system, pillaging will have your empire siphon resources from the system, and raising will slowly destroy everything in the system. So far, we've explained everything that could help when starting a game of Endless Space 2, but this is a deep game. There are a lot of other important aspects that gets unlocked during the later parts of the game that we haven't discussed. Before we end, I'd like to go through some of these aspects briefly. Another useful part of the game is the market. 
As you're probably tired of hearing by now, a certain technology needs to be researched to unlock this aspect of the game. The market unlocks the ability to buy and sell things like resources and ships. And like most markets, prices will change depending on demand and supply. Trading companies are a way to increase your income in the game by creating trade routes between your systems and even with other empire systems through a trade agreement or an alliance. Setting up a trading company will require building the system improvements, headquarters, and subsidiaries, which can be unlocked by a technology. These improvements will spawn non-controllable ships that will travel system to system, increasing not just dust income, but other resources as well. Basically, the more systems they travel through, the higher the income. You can also buy additional ships for your trading companies to further increase your gains from them. However, these ships must always have unhindered routes for them to function. Enemies can simply stop these trading companies from working by guarding or even capturing relevant systems in the trade routes. As mentioned earlier, during the later parts of the game, more and more star system functions can be unlocked through technologies, and I'd like to mention a few that I think are very important. First, with the right technologies and resources, you can level up systems, not just to increase their production, but also to unlock other functions such as moving population from one system to another. As mentioned earlier, certain population types are more efficient when inhabiting planets with certain traits. This can help manage your population better for increased production of resources. Leveling up systems will first require you to advance the tier level of the economy and trade quadrant in the technology wheel as you can see here. Then, you will need to assign a luxury resource cost for each succeeding level. There are two things to consider when designating a luxury resource for each level. One is the abundance of the resource in your empire, as leveling star systems is done individually like system improvements and will cost the same amount of resource each time you level up a system, so this action can be costly. The second thing is the bonus production that the resource will provide once it has been leveled up. When choosing a luxury resource, you can see here what additional production they will provide if they are chosen as the level up requirement. Take note that choosing a luxury resource for this action is permanent and cannot be changed or undone. Aside from emigrating population, through technologies, you can also have the ability to terraform planets to help them fit the inhabiting population better. While admittedly, this video is quite long, as I mentioned earlier, this isn't a fully comprehensive tutorial. Endless Space 2 is a deep game. There are a lot of aspects of the game that I either chose to omit from this tutorial or simply missed. Regardless, the information provided should be enough for you to be able to start a game knowing what you can do, what you'd like to do, and how you will go about doing those things. Thanks for watching.